Zoom. Uh, we'll get started. I'm Sarah Lambert. I work at Yale School of Medicine. And I'm a pediatric urologist. So today we're going to be talking about hydroureteronephrosis, um, mega ureter, and beyond. I have no relevant disclosures. So starting with the basic anatomy of the ureter and the ureterovesical junction, the ureteral diameter has an upper limit of 5 to 6.5 millimeters, and that's in infants from 30 weeks gestation to teenage years and puberty. The percentage of patients with a duplex collecting system is 0.7%, although we see about 2 to 4% of our patients who are presenting with urinary tract symptoms are found to have duplex systems. So certainly there's a correlation between having a duplex system and ultimately having urinary tract uh, conditions or concerns. When we're talking about the general anatomy of the ureter and the ureteral vesicle junction, we think about the ureteric bud and the common nephric duct, and the weigert meyer rule holds true for a complete duplication. So in patients who have a duplex system with complete duplication, the upper pole will always enter the bladder medially and distally, and the lower pole will enter laterally and proximally. Matthew Stevens added on to the weigert meyer rule, stating that the upper pole will typically obstruct while the lower pole will reflux. So that'll be helpful in interpreting our BCUGs and how to approach our patients surgically if necessary. So when we think about hydronephrosis, it's one of the most common things we see in pediatric urology. Patients can present prenatally, which we see more and more commonly. They can be symptomatic in childhood or adolescence, or they can be found incidentally on imaging for other causes. Hydronephrosis is the most commonly detected anomaly on prenatal ultrasound, and approximately 1 to 5 percent of pregnancies have children with hydronephrosis or antenatal pilectasis. Hydroureteronephrosis falls under the same umbrella as hydronephrosis, and a well-accepted definition is a ureteral diameter greater than 7 millimeters. So if you remember, our upper limit of normal was 6.5 millimeters. The term mega ureter describes ureteral dilation, but it does not describe an etiology. And there may or may not be renal pelvis dilation associated with the mega ureter. Although hydroureteronephrosis as a term includes both the collecting system, renal pelvis, and ureter. Currently, there's no documentation of a correlation between the diagnosis of prenatal hydroureteronephrosis and a postnatal outcome. So that alone cannot allow you to provide a diagnosis for most patients with hydroureteronephrosis before they're born. So when we think about antenatal hydronephrosis, the vast majority of these children are going to have transient or physiologic hydronephrosis. So it's 50 to 70 percent of the children we see antenatally are not going to require any intervention after they're born. They will require an ultrasound and follow-up, but will likely resolve on their own. The next two most common etiologies are ureteral pelvic junction obstruction and vesico-ureteral reflux. Today we're going to be discussing ureteral vesical junction obstruction, or primary obstructing mega ureter, ureteroseal, ectopic ureter, and a duplex system. And you can see those last three are some of the least common things that we'll actually find on antenatal hydronephrosis, although things such as prune belly syndrome uh, and posterior urethral valves, although uncommon, are very important to diagnose early. So when we're looking at prenatal ultrasounds or seeing reports from the MFM folks or the OBs, it's important to look at the amniotic fluid index. This is going to tell you if there's any oligohydramnios. And one of the primary causes of oligohydramnios can be the a bladder outlet obstruction or an abnormality with renal function. There are other causes, including amniotic leak and other issues, maternal hydration, but certainly it's something we should consider and look at on all of our ultrasounds. It's important to understand if the dilation is unilateral or bilateral, given that it's bilateral, we'll have a higher concern for this infant. We look at the renal parenchyma, determine if it appears to have normal cortical medullary differentiation, uh, which at this level would probably be echogenicity would be abnormal. Uh, difficult to see, uh, always see renal pyramids, although sometimes you can appreciate them antenatally as well. If you have an ultrasound that documents an upper pole renal cyst, you might want to consider that being in a duplex system. Uh, so it's difficult to give an exact diagnosis for many of these children before they're born, although you can certainly lay out the different options and etiologies to parents and families. Uh, we are going to be looking for ureteral dilation as well, 
and whether or not the bladder is normal. So that's important for patients who have posterior urethral valves, for patients with any other form of bladder outlet obstruction, prune belly syndrome, or other etiologies. Patients with neurogenic bladder at this point will not have any abnormalities on their ultrasounds. So when we think about how to assess hydronephrosis, the Society of Fetal Urology grading scale is very helpful. Uh, it's been around for a while, and it's the interpretation of the calyx yield dilatation and parenchymal appearance. So there's two factors that are contributing, and you can see it's graded from SFU grade one to SFU grade four. It does not account for the ureter or the bladder, so any abnormalities there are outside this grading system, and it is a subjective assessment by the MFM folks, the radiology folks, pediatric urologists, pediatric nephrologists, and anyone else involved in the child's care. The good news is there's a high resolution rate for children who has SFU grades one to two, although there's less likely to be spontaneous resolution with SFU grades three to four, so that's helpful in counseling patients prenatally as well. A more recent grading scale is the urinary tract dilation score, or the UTD score, and this includes seven parameters, the anterior posterior renal pelvic diameter, the presence or absence of calyceal dilatation, renal parenchymal thickness, renal parenchymal appearance, any ureteral abnormalities, bladder abnormalities, and oligohydramnios. So that is the addition and is very helpful, especially in the population we're discussing today. The ultrasound you see to, on the slide here de demonstrates both pelvic um, calyceal dilation, peripheral and central ureteral dilation, and what appears to be at least a somewhat normal bladder although I would argue it's difficult to detect in that ultrasound. So when we think about how to classify these patients, antenatal type 1 are patients who have central calyceal dilatation and dilation less than 7 millimeters or less than 10 millimeters, depending on if they are in the first and second trimester or the third trimester. So patients who have hydroureteronephrosis are automatically included in group antenatal 2 to 3 because of their abnormal ureter. If there's any abnormal parenchyma or calyceal dilatation, that's even more concerning. Other reasons to be added into this group are, are dilatation of the APD, which is the anterior pelvic diameter, um, of greater than seven millimeters or greater than 10 millimeters in the third trimester. So when we think of how we manage these patients, group one gets an ultrasound 48 hours after birth and is followed with maybe one repeat ultrasound in the third trimester. The group that is higher risk is going to have serial ultrasounds antenatally and will ultimately have that same postnatal ultrasound at 48 hours. And we'll discuss what happens after birth um, shortly. There are some of these children who are going to need urgent evaluation sooner than 48 hours. Those would be children that you're concerned for bladder outlet obstruction, bilateral obstruction, or a solitary kidney that's affected. So when we think about patients who require intervention before they're born, the primary indicator for pre prenatal intervention is bladder outlet obstruction. It affects both kidneys or then there's oligohydramnios. So the most common intervention performed is the vesicoamniotic shunt, which has various parameters for placement, uh, usually electrolytes from the urine and serial bladder taps, and it has some difficulties with placement and dislodgement, uh, but can be useful in some circumstances. We're not gonna talk about that in any more detail. It's a little beyond our scope today. Uh, Rarely there's been descriptions of cystoscopic antegrade valve ablation for posterior urethral valves. And prenatal intervention is typically common for posterior urethral valves or prune belly syndrome. There's currently no indication for prenatal intervention for a ureteral vesicle junction obstruction or a UPJ obstruction, although there have been case reports of uh, fetal surgery to puncture ureteroceles. So when we think about our postnatal management goals, we want to preserve renal function in these patients. We want to minimize their infection risk. And if they are having urinary incontinence, we'd like to achieve continence for them, not incontinence. <laughs> so when we think about their history, they typically have a history of antenatal hydroureteral nephrosis. That's how many children come to us. Most of these kids are asymptomatic. If they are going to have symptoms, they can have symptoms from a space-occupying lesion if the system is very dilated. So that would be failure to thrive, feeding difficulties, a flank mass. They can sometimes present with febrile urinary tract infections or hematuria. When we think of older kids who are coming into our offices and are presenting in a symptomatic fashion, they present with urinary tract infection. They can at times have flank pain. Some children can develop nephrolithiasis in an obstructed system. They can have hematuria and are more likely to have hematuria associated with trauma. 
they can have hypertension. Epididymitis can be seen in boys who have ectopic ureters that are draining to the seminal vesicles, vas deferens, um, or elsewhere. And urinary incontinence can be found in girls with ectopic ureters. That will not be found in boys, as boys always terminate above the pelvic diaphragm. So on physical exam, some patients can have a, an abdominal mass. You can find fever in girls. Rarely, you can have a prolapsed ureter seal. That's a picture of a prolapsed ureter seal here, which should not be confused with a urethral prolapse, which is a more of the donut in appearance. Um, there's also rhabdomyosarcoma that can lead to lesions in the enteritis in girls. That's usually a sac of grapes appearance. And there can be an imperfect hymen, which is usually a shiny whitish um, layer beneath the urethra. There can also be an ectopic ureteral orifice that can be identified. Some children can be seen to have continuous incontinence with an ectopic ureter, and those would be girls. And purulent discharge can also be seen from an infected ectopic ureter. Boys, again, can have epididymitis if they have an ectopic ureter. So our first test to evaluate these children after our exam and history is going to be an ultrasound. And we're gonna look at the renal parenchyma to determine if there's been any damage or any dysplasia prior to their birth. And we're gonna evaluate the bladder very closely because that's how you're gonna be able to differentiate the different etiologies for hydrourethral nephrosis. So a ureter seal is typically thin-walled on ultrasound. It looks like a cystic di dilatation and it's intravesical. There should not be an extravesical component of a ureter seal. And the angle is typically acute between the wall of the ureter seal and the bladder wall. An ectopic ureter is thick-walled because remember you have your ureteral musculature, you have your peritoneum, you have the bladder musculature. So it's not just that thin layer of uh, mucosa. There's an extra vesicle component very commonly in ectopic ureters that you can identify and the angle of the ectopic ureter or pseudo ureteral seal, as it is sometimes called, is more obtuse in relationship to the wall of the bladder. Ectopic ureters are more classically found, especially in single systems, with dysplastic parenchyma in comparison to a mega ureter, which more commonly has more normally appearing parenchyma. A primary obstructive mega ureter has no intervesical component and usually has minimal bladder distortion. These are some images of ureter seals. I couldn't find you a good image of a pseudo ureter seal, but I'll keep looking. So this is a single system ureter seal. Uh, this is pelvis seal and calyx seal dilatation, so the renal pelvis, all the calyces are dilated. There is thinning of the parenchyma. You see a dilated ureter here, and you see a small intravesical ureter seal, at least appears to be intravesical from this image, and there's the acute angle I was discussing with a thin wall. And the picture down here is a duplex system. With a ureter seal, you see upper pole dilation. You could see how arguably on an antenatal um, fetal ultrasound, you could argue someone might read this as a renal cyst, but in fact, it's a duplicated system with a dilated upper pole. You have normal cortical medullary differentiation at the lower pole. These are your normal medullary pyramids. And this is your bladder with your thin walled ureter seal and your acute angle entering the bladder itself. And those are some of the clues on ultrasound. So when we think about pitfalls for reading these ultrasounds, a large ureter seal can completely fill the bladder and you can miss the ureter seal itself. And a full bladder can mask or efface the ureter seal. So if the bladder is almost filled with contrast, you uh, at times are going to miss the, a small ureter seal and it's overwhelmed by the contrast. And if it is very full or voiding, you can actually efface the ureter seal and it appears more to be a diverticulum at that point. So you always want to obtain early filling images. That's how you'll avoid that pitfall and you'll be able to see the defect on VCUG from where the ureter seal is located. So after these children are born, we're planning on getting an ultrasound at 48 hours approximately. And in the children who are low risk, that's our initial goal. Today we're gonna to discuss about the children who are intermediate and high risk given their abnormal ureter. So anyone with hydroureter nephrosis is automatically a P2 or a P3. Now what makes you a P3 and not a P2 in the UTD classification is that you have peripheral calyx seal dilatation and abnormal parenchymal thickness or appearance. Additionally, if there's any abnormality to the bladder, that will also classify that child as high risk. These are the management recommendations based on the risk categorization. So patients with high risk are going to require a sooner ultrasound follow-up, 
a VCUG is going to be recommended. Again, those children with bladder abnormalities um, are going to be an abnormal parenchyma. We had higher risk for posterior urethral valves or bladder outlet obstruction. So that is one of the reasons to be getting the VCUG in those patients. Antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended, and the renal scan will be determined on the uh, presumed etiology of the hydroureter nephrosis. For the intermediate risk, a lot more is left up to the discretion of the urologist, although they do recommend a follow-up ultrasound in one to three months, which is a shorter duration than the lowest group. So when we think about our differential diagnosis, we can break them into primary and secondary diagnoses. Today, we're only gonna be talking about primary diagnoses. So we have there are four mega ureter variations, which we'll discuss, a ureter seal, which can be in a single system or a duplex system, and an ectopic ureter, which again can be single system or duplex system. Our secondary causes of a dilated ureter are bladder outlet obstruction, neurogenic bladder, although not in a newborn, and prune belly syndrome. Stone disease and stricture disease can also, as you well know, cause hydroureter nephrosis, uh, but will not be discussed today. So do these children need antibiotic prophylaxis is a discussion uh, amongst pediatric urologists that is still ongoing. Our, one of our management goals we discussed earlier is to minimize the risk of infection in these children. And the UTD classification recommends antibiotic prophylaxis for high-risk patients. And that's backed up by some of the literature looking at risk factors for UTI in children with hydronephrosis and hydroureter nephrosis. So those risk factors include distal ureteral dilation, increases your risk for UTI. Age less than six months of age, increases your risk of UTI. Girls have a higher risk of UTI and uncircumcised boys do as well. The highest risk period for uncircumcised boys is again in the first six months of age. I always begin my prophylaxis before I start the VCUG because if they do have reflux, if they do have an abnormality uh, that's concerning and puts them at a higher risk, I don't want them to have an infection from their VCUG itself. So when we think about mega ureters and antibiotic prophylaxis, there have been some studies evaluating the usefulness and utility, and there's a higher risk for UTI in children with a ureteral vesicle junction obstruction versus a ureteral pelvic junction obstruction, which makes sense. You have stasis of urine closer down to the bladder, more likely to be infected than up at the renal pelvis, and it's most common in the first six months of life. So certainly starting these infants on antibiotic prophylaxis, I think is a, is a safe practice. The incidence of UTI is approximately one per year without any antibiotics or intervention, and about 35% of those patients can require a hospital admission for that UTI. There's an 83% decrease in the incidence of UTI with antibiotic prophylaxis in the first year to six months. If that interval is extended to a year, there's still a 55% decrease in the incidence of UTI. So I believe, and this, the BAPU is the British Association of Pediatric Urology, and they also recommend antibiotics for the first six to 12 months of life, and then at the discretion of the clinician. So once we have our ultrasound and we understand some of the anatomy, we also want to perform a BCUG that's going to show us some function and some further anatomy as well, and it'll be able to rule out bladder outlet obstruction and other issues we weren't able to definitively diagnose on ultrasound. So it's recommended for our UTD high-risk patients. It's also recommended by the SFU consensus statement for hydroureter when associated with vesico, um, when associated with bladder dilation, I'm sorry, bilateral dilation, abnormal renal parenchyma, and abnormal bladder architecture. So that mimics the patients that we saw in the UTD high risk category. It's also recommended for infants with hydroureter by the AU8 guidelines for vesicoureteral reflux. So when a child you're evaluating for febrile UTI and vesicoureteral reflux, if you're found, they're found to have hydroureter, the AUA recommends a VCUG as well. If it's unilateral and the kidney is otherwise normal, both the parenchyma and the bladder appears normal, then most guidelines say it's up to the clinician discretion, but I wanna caution you to have a high index of suspicion in male infants for bladder outlet obstruction because you can have unilateral vesicoureteral reflux and unilateral hydronephrosis, associate, hydroureteral nephrosis associated with posterior urethral valves. And 14% of boys with posterior urethral valves will have unilateral hydroureteral nephrosis. The good thing is 87% of those patients will also have bladder abnormalities. So hopefully that'll be guiding and you'll be less likely to miss that, but it's something to keep in mind. So when we look at the VCUG, we get information about our upper tracts. We also get information about the bladder. So this is a classic image at number B of a duplex system. That's a drooping lily. 
And what that means, if you look at the calyces, rather than pointing to the contralateral shoulder, they're pointing to the ipsilateral shoulder or the axis of the kidney. And that is because there's an upper pole in image B that is not refluxing, but is depressing the lower pole. This is a ureteroceal that you can clearly see is a filling defect within the bladder. It's important when BCUGs are done to be done with feeding tubes and not with Foley catheters as they can sometimes mimic ureteroceals or obscure a ureteroceal. Uh, so that's how they should probably, properly be done. Uh, and that's a ureteroceal you probably wouldn't miss, but sometimes smaller ones when the bladder begins to fill, you can miss them entirely. So look at those early filling images. On the right, you see a child who has bilateral hydroureter nephrosis, but he also has posterior urethral valves. If you look at the dilated prostatic urethra and then the narrowing at the valve, uh, just distal to the Vero Montanum. So it's important to remember that we're not only looking at hydroureter nephrosis, but you need to look at the urethra as well so you don't miss bladder outlet obstruction. So following our renal ultrasound and our VCUG, the functional assessment can be performed in some children who require that. If there's no bladder outlet obstruction and no diagnosis of reflux, if you clearly have a child who has vesco-ureteral reflux and no evidence of obstruction who drains well on BCUG, and or you have a child with posterior urethral valve, those will be addressed prior to obtaining a medically renal scan. In most circumstances, you won't need the renal scan initially. The British Association of Pediatric Urology recommends for a, a MAG3 renal scan for ureteral dilation greater than 10 millimeters. The AUA does not have any consensus statements or guidelines for this yet, but it's a helpful uh, governing board. And any associated parenchymal thinning is another indication for a MAG3 renal scan. At times, you can use a DMSA renal scan. That's going to be your gold standard for your functional assessment. Uh, and I would recommend if you are having difficulty determining whether or not to do an extirpative surgery to remove an upper pole or to remove a potentially non-functioning kidney uh, rather than reconstructing the system, I would recommend a DMSA scan to determine the function. MR urography is wonderful if you have that in your institution. Uh, it helps to delineate the complex anatomy and can also give you the PAT-like values and their functional assessment as well. Um, an MRI is helpful in the absence of an MRU if you have complex anatomy you need to further understand. It's also helpful in finding a dilate, non-dilated ectopic ureter, which is easily missed on ultrasound. So which of these patients require urgent intervention for us? And what are the indications for that. So a patient who has a severe infection, who has bilateral obstruction or bladder outlet obstruction, and for our three primary causes of hydroureter and nephrosis, a prolapsed ureter seal would be the most likely cause of bladder outlet obstruction, which is thankfully pretty rare. So we'd initially treat these patients with antibiotics. If they respond to antibiotics, that's all they need in, in, in the immediate uh, period. If not, they may need a ureter seal puncture in the instance of a ureter seal, which is done cystoscopically. For any of these uh, children who have hydroureter nephrosis, a percutaneous nephrostomy tube can be placed. The complications, as I'm sure you well know, are dislodgement, infection, serial replacements for these children if you're waiting to repair their bladder and their ureter until they are older and are more amenable to bladder surgery. A cutaneous ureterostomy is an option, which is bringing the ureteral stump to the anterior abdominal wall and allowing for drainage. They are prone to stomal stenosis. They can have pyelonephritis, and if you have a bilateral of process, you can have a defunctionalized bladder. So a more recent description is bladder marsupialization or a refluxing reimplant, which is converting obstruction to the lesser evil of vesicoureteral reflux. It maintains bladder cycling in patients who have bilateral obstruction, and there is still a UTI risk as you've created a re refluxing system. So we're going to quickly talk about ureter seal, ectopic ureter, and then POM separately to have an understanding of the slight nuances in their management. So ureter seal is the cystic dilatation of the distal ureter. It's unilateral or bilateral, singular duplex system, and it will be the upper pole in a duplex system. So this patient has a large ureter seal that you could, if the bladder was decompressed, you could arguably miss because you may think this is the bladder itself. This is reflux into the uh, dilated lower pole system. And this is your upper pole system here that you can't see. The most important description for a ureter seal in my mind is whether it's intravesical or extravesical. There are a lot of different descriptors for ureter seal. Uh, Stevens described the seco ureter seal, the stenotic sphincteric ureter seal, the sphincto stenotic ureter seal, blind and non-obstructed. 
but the most important of all those categorizations and difficult um, differences in descriptions would be is, is it intravesical or extravesical is it above the bladder neck or not if it's located in the bladder bladder neck or urethra so if it's in the bladder it's usually going to respond more easily to a ureteroseal puncture and has less complications than an ectopic or extravesical ureteroseal So when we think about managing our ureter seals, our main goal is to maximize drainage and function of that kidney. We also want to minimize the risk of vesicle ureteral reflux because most of these patients undergo a ureter seal puncture, or at least many of them do, which can create de novo reflux. So when we think about how we're managing these patients, it's important to recognize whether or not you want to put them at risk for development of reflux into that upper pole system. So our intervention indications are decreased renal function, a child who's symptomatic with UTI or flank pain, bilateral ureter seals, or a prolapsed obstructed ureter seal, which is urgent. Uh, you can also observe some ureter seals, a small single system intravesical ureter seal not associated with calyx seal dilatation can be observed. Um, you often see a cobra head if you ever have an IVP for those patients. And surveillance is, is required because some of these patients will ultimately deteriorate and have urinary tract infections, some can stone form stones within the ureter seal. So it's important that the patient is aware that there can be long-term concerns, even with a small single system intravascular ureter seal that you're observing. So our first step is often a ureter seal puncture, which is performed cystoscopically. And there's a high success rate for decompression and relief of obstruction, somewhere between 78 to 97%. There are two typical techniques. One is a low transverse incision into the ureter seal, and the other is a quote unquote, watering can and puncture via laser. Um, so that's using either the holmium laser or the diode laser with the large fiber, maybe 400 or 500 micron. And you're going to be making multiple punctures into the ureter seal to allow for decompression, hopefully not cause any obs recurrent obstruction once they heal, but allow persistent drainage and decrease your risk of reflux. So that's the main goal of that procedure. And in some studies comparing a low transverse incision and a watering can, there's a decreased risk of de novo vesicle ureteral reflux. And that is our main risk of ureteral seal puncture. Some of these children can develop urinary tract infections. It's important to recognize that if you do have an ectopic ureteral seal into the urethra, that if you puncture that in the middle, you can fill through the puncture site the distal end of that ureteral seal and ultimately have a windsock effect that can obstruct the urethra. So that's one of the reasons why ectopic ure ureter seals are more challenging um, than orthotopic ureter seals. So when we think about success rates, and I put a little asterisk next to cure because there are some long-term failures in children who had an initial VCUG without vesicle ureteral reflux and a decompressed system on ultrasound who ultimately develop reflux later in life. Uh, but it is 55 to 80% for a single system, and you can see that success rate drops to 29 and 15% for ectopic and duplex systems. The good news is that even if reflux does occur or there is an indication for a further operation at the level of the bladder after you perform your ureter seal, by decompressing the system, it makes it easier to perform your reimplant later on. So when we think about the operative interventions for those ureter seals, ureter seal excision with ureteral reimplantation is performed at the level of the bladder. It can be performed for singular or duplex systems, and it allows for any bladder neck or posterior bladder wall reconstruction to prevent incontinence from a large ureter seal or an ectopic ureter seal that's affected the bladder neck or the posterior wall. There's a risk of vesicle ureteral reflux or obstruction with your reimplant. Uh, ureter ure, ureterostomy is performed at the level of the ureter. You want a patient who has no lower pole reflux because you don't want to add your obstructed system to a now refluxing system. So typically, if there's a significant amount of reflux, you could argue for a low-grade reflux that that would not matter. Um, most people would prefer not to do a ureter or ureterostomy. There is a risk of obstruction and damage to the lower pole ureter. If the upper pole segment is not functioning or it's a single system uh, with a poorly functioning kidney, you can consider an upper pole hemonephrectomy or a nephrectomy uh, with or without ureter seal excision. So again, it's typically for non-functioning. There should be no lower pole vesicle ureteral reflux that would be significant because at that point, those children would require a bladder level surgery as well. And there is a risk to damage to the lower pole, and there are case reports of loss of the lower pole, although luckily not very common. Uh, de novo vesicle ureteral reflux after 
a hemianephrectomy and decompression of the ureter seal from above can occur in 15 to 50% of patients. It's important to counsel your patients and recognize that going forward. This is a photograph of a large ureter seal. If you remember that VCUG you saw earlier, um, there is a catheter in the dilated lower pole ureter. There's a feeding tube in the contralateral ureter. You wanna make sure your dissection doesn't damage your contralateral ureter. And this is your bladder neck. So this is an orthotopic, very large ureter seal in a duplex system. This is the dissection. We're performing this at the level of the bladder, not doing any upper tract work, and a common sheath reimplant will be performed. So moving on to ectopic ureters. An ectopic ureter is simply described as a ureter that does not enter the trigome. It's in 0.3 to 6% of the population and oftentimes has no concerns. It's 5 to 17% 70, bilateral. It's more common in girls and it's 80% associated with a duplex system. It's more common to be single systems in boys, and I think I misspoke. I said it was, it's commonly symptomatic, not uncommonly. Uh, this is an ultrasound of a duplex system with an ectopic ureter, and you see the upper tract dilation, and there's some mild lower tract dilation as well, whether that's from reflux or from some obstruction from the upper tract, it's difficult to tell. And then here is your duplex system on the left with an IVP, and this is a non-dilated upper tract that may present in, let's say, a girl with incontinence after potty training. So when we think about the location of ureteral ectopia, girls, it's most commonly in the urethra, vestibule, vagina, or uterus. And in boys, the posterior urethra seminal vesicles are much more common than the ejaculatory duct or vas deferens. So the clinical presentation of an ectopic ureter. In boys, again, there is no urinary incontinence but they can present with epididymitis, UTI, and lower urinary tract symptoms. So any prepubertal boy who has a bacterial epididymitis, I would strongly recommend obtaining a renal and bladder ultrasound or some type of imaging to rule out any abnormalities uh, of the upper tracts. In girls, they have continuous urinary incontinence. They can have vaginal discharge and UTIs and lower urinary tract symptoms as well, in addition to their incontinence. For urinary tract infections, they can be treated with antibiotic treatment. If that fails, they may need a percutaneous nephrostomy tube or uh, cutaneous ureterostomy. Again, that system doesn't drainage their bladder, so Foley catheter drainage won't be helpful in those patients. So our treatments are very similar to the ureter seal, a nephrectomy or a hemi-nephrectomy for a non-functional system, a ureterostomy as well for a, non, for a system that has good function of the upper pole or even a non-functioning upper pole or limited function if you want to avoid um, operating on, at the level of the kidney and the risk of damage to the lower pole. The question in both of those approaches is what to do with the distal ureter. So we try to dissect the ureteral stump to varying degrees. I try to bring it as low as possible if I'm performing it robotically um, or laparoscopically, and that's because there is a risk of vesicoureteral reflux into that ectopic ureter or infection. And if that is to occur, those children will ultimately require an operation at the level of the bladder, which can be uh, more difficult to perform, and hopefully we can avoid that for most patients. Ureteral reimplantation is your other option. You don't need to operate on the upper tract at all. You can do this with single system or bilateral duplex systems. It allows for bladder neck reconstruction. Again, if there's any abnormality from the ectopic ureter, and you can treat any lower pole vesicle ureteral reflux or contralateral vesicle ureteral reflux at the same time. So moving on to mega ureters, there are four types of mega ureters, non-obstructed, non-refluxing, obstructed, refluxing, and obstructed refluxing. And the biggest question for these groups of patients is who needs surgical repair and who can be observed? And you can see from the schematic that there are primary and secondary causes of each. So we're only gonna be talking about the primary causes um, of mega ureter. So primary obstructive mega ureter is what we're gonna be focusing on. It's a dilated ureter with an adynamic segment at or near the ureteral vesicle junction. There are some differing studies determining whether it's collagen de deposition and formation, whether it's interstitial cells of Cajal that are abnormal, but in general, there's a cranial to caudal muscle development of the ureter. And the intervesical ureter is what matures last and continues to mature after birth. So some of these children who have obstruction and resolve spontaneously within the first year, it may be the natural development of this distal ureteral musculature. The refluxing mega ureter is typically from vesical ureteral reflux. Refluxing obstructed mega ureter is typically an ectopic ureter to the bladder neck or to the sphincter. 
and a non-refluxing, non-obstructed mega ureter is sort of what I discussed with potential late development of the ureteral musculature that resolves spontaneously. So when we think of the demographics of primary obstructing mega ureters, they're more common in boys. They're more common on the left than the right. 25% can be bilateral. And 10 to 15% of these are associated with contralateral anomalies. So it's important to always consider evaluation for the contralateral kidney. It's commonly detected on prenatal ultrasound, and most often these children are asymptomatic. So in a consensus statement, the neonatal management is antibiotic prophylaxis, ultrasound and VCUG, and a MAG3 renal scan if there's no uh, causative sign that vesicoureteral reflux or bladder outlet obstruction are the etiology. Our intervention indications include febrile urinary tract infection, pain, a differential renal function on MAG3 renal scan of 40, less than 40%, or a serial decrease in differential renal function of greater than 5%. Additionally, some would argue that progressive hydronephrosis is enough to um, recommend operation and repair. So who can we observe? So 73 to 85% of POMs have long-term spontaneous resolution, which is great. The time to resolution is inversely related to their diameter. So those children with a larger ureteral diameter at the level of the bladder will be taking much longer to resolve than those with smaller dilation. One study demonstrated that all children who had 8.5 millimeters or less diameter of the lower uh, ureter, distal ureter, resolved spontaneously, whereas none of the children who had distal ureteral dilation of greater than 15 millimeters resolved spontaneously and they all required intervention. A diameter of greater than 10 millimeters is at higher risk for complications for these children, including urinary tract infection, nephrolithiasis, abdominal pain, and unfortunately, long-term de uh, decompensation of the system and renal function. There are some case reports of stable mega ureters that have been discharged from follow-up in the pediatric um, practice and that can worsen at puberty or beyond. So I would urge you to continue to follow these children with ultrasound at the very least. And if there's worsening dilatation, consider getting a MAG3 renal scan. Some of these young adults develop stones. One young adult with bilateral disease developed chronic renal insufficiency. So our intervention for our primary obstructing mega ureter is very similar to what we described above. Ureteral reimplantation, which can be performed between nine and 18 months of age. Usually we want these bladders to get slightly bigger before you attempt to reimplant a large dilated ureter. And that is the reason for the delay to nine to 18 months of age. And there's discussion as to whether or not ureteral tapering is necessary um, and whether there's a benefit to ureteral tapering, which we'll discuss next. More recently, endoscopic balloon dilation and endoureterotomy have been offered as options with a success rate in the literature of greater than 70%. 15% of these patients required retreatment endoscopically and 37% required surgical reintervention. Most of these studies are single institution retrospective studies of small groups of patients. So clearly we need some long-term observation uh, of this group. The risks associated with endoscopic balloon dilation are UTI, stent migration, hematuria, stone formation, and the creation of vesicoureteral reflux. There's only been one case report of needing to perform an open operation at the time of dilation for a complication. So when we think about reimplantation for a POM, we think about the possibility of needing to do ureteral tapering. And we would initially excise the adynamic segment so we can prevent reflux and we can prevent obstructions. We use that classic one to five ratio, which was initially described in the 1950s and people still use today for determining the length of the um, submucosal tunnel. You also wanna make sure that you taper gradually to prevent obstruction at the level of your initiation of the tapering in the upper ureter. So there's two different techniques, plication and excisional tapering. Plication, you could argue, is the more conservative approach. It preserves the ureteral blood supply and it is typically used for a ureteral diameter of less than 1.75 centimeters. There's the star plication and the Kalasinski fold technique. The star plication is over a catheter with Lembert plications. And Kalasinski is a folded technique where there's a running suture alongside the catheter and the lateral portion is the uh, not used portion with the less vasculature and that is folded posteriorly behind uh, the true lumen that you've created over your catheter. Excisional tapering was initially described by Hardy Hendren. There is a risk of stenosis and ischemia. Uh, 
Uh, it's better for mass of your redural dilation when you don't feel that predication will be successful, and you always want to excise laterally because that's your less vascular area of the ureter. So we look at our outcomes. There's a 90% success rate, and in a study comparing ureteral tapering versus non-tapering, there did not appear to be any significant difference in success. The complications are vesicoureteral reflux or obstruction. There are worse surgical outcomes, much like reimplants for vesicoureteral reflux in children who have bowel and bladder dysfunction. So it's important to treat that first and continue to monitor that in follow-up. These patients will also require serial ultrasounds. Um, anyone who has persistent hydroureteral nephrosis after their reimplantation should have a MAG3 renal scan to assess for drainage. If the ultrasound is demonstrating clear decreased um, dilation and decompression of the system, I don't think a MAG3 is warranted. So if we think about our summary of what we discussed today, most of these patients are detected prenatally. Postnatal diagnosis is usually includes an ultrasound or VCUG. I would recommend if there's hydroureteral nephrosis to strongly consider antibiotic prophylaxis while you're doing your investigation. We're going to determine who is able to be observed safely and who requires intervention. And of course, determining who needs urgent intervention is important. So our goals are to preserve function, prevent our infections, and correct any incontinence. And whether that is an extirpative repair or hopefully reconstruction, um, will be up to you and what you determine on your evaluation. And that is my presentation for today. If there are any questions, So there's a question asking how easy it is to get a proper MRI in a child seeing that they rarely hold still. So in a newborn, they can often be swaddled, fed before they go in the MRI, and they will often sleep through the MRI, and you can do that without any sedation. Um, in older children, they often require sedation for an MRI to get an accurate study, and certainly for an MRI urography, they're going to require sedation as it's a long study. The second question is, how great is the concern for antibiotic resistance in those kids on, on prophylactic antibiotics? So there certainly is, and I would recommend in your hospital and your children's hospital and your community to understand the antibiograms and use your antibiotics appropriately. Uh, I like to use nitrofurantoin as a prophylaxis because it's not an antibiotic that I would use to treat a true infection. Um, so therefore, if someone was coming in with a urosepsis, nitrofurantoin would never be my choice. Um, there is that risk of interstitial pneumonitis in one in 100,000 patients. So it's not without risk, and it can only be used in patients over two months of age. And I think it's really determining the balance between infection um, and urosepsis and that risk of antibiotic resistance. The second question, how do you determine surgical treatment in non-refluxing, non-obstructive mega ureter. So the good news is a non-refluxing, non-obstructive mega ureter should not require any treatment, and it can be followed with ultrasound. If the hydronephrosis is worsening or they become symptomatic, then I would recommend reassessing them with the MAG3 renal scan. But those are children who can be observed. And I think that's all the questions. So thank you everybody for listening. I hope all everyone is healthy and well and getting back to work shortly. <laughs>